Thank you, Miss Stacy and Dad and Roger Dale. To have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 9. Steve Lawson, who is our resident teacher here at Sunday School, along with Roger Dale, refers to some text in Scripture as mountain peak text. And the last two Sundays that I preached, we were on one of the highest peaks in all of Scripture, the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And now, as we come back to Colossians 3, we come back down the mountain from one of its highest peaks, but we're still on the mountain. Because all of Scripture is a mountain range. But here, we're going to return to some very practical issues in the area of sanctification with some of the realities of Christian living. If you're a soldier in the army or a police officer, when you're on duty, you have to dress the part, right? I mean, you have to put on the uniform, right? And you can think of many cases where that is true. Mailman, uh, certain companies make you wear a uniform to go to work for them. Even white collar jobs like a banker or a lawyer, they, they wear a suit to work. What I'm wearing today is what R.C. Sproul calls the absolutely necessary uniform of the pastor. Sad some pastors, many pastors today don't get that. So we really are a uniformed society in this sense. I mean, when you see a person going off to work, you can get a pretty good idea of what they do by how they dress. It depends on what day you catch me on. But both of my uniforms reflect what I do, depending on what I'm doing that day. So what we wear is connected to what we are. And that is Paul's point in Colossians 3. In the spiritual sense, we need to dress ourselves spiritually in order that we might meet our spiritual identity in Christ. In other words, if you're a Christian, you ought to dress the part. A new man should wear new clothes. And he's not worth talking about wearing a t-shirt with a fish on it. He's talking about spiritual clothes. Your style of living. If you're a new creature in Christ, there are some spiritual clothes that go along with that. Remember how we've talked about when you believed your old man died. You were, you were born again. We've been talking about that in Sunday school. We talked about in that in the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. You were born a new person. And as an aside, just make sure everybody understands. When I say the word man, that is equated with mankind. That's talking about men and women. Mankind. And the new man in Christ, the inner redeemed new you, doesn't want to wear them old clothes. That's why traditionally, going way, way back, when a per person is baptized, and this goes way back, they don't wear their old clothes. What do they wear? A white robe. You know, in the old days, in some traditions, they actually literally threw away their old clothes and gave them a white robe when they were baptized. That new white robe 
is a symbol of a new identity. It, it, it carries the idea over here as Paul sees us with Christ, dying in Christ and rising in new life. And notice in verse 9, in verse 9 you see that term, the old self. And then in verse 10, look at it, you see the term, the new self. Now, those terms have brought up a lot of theological discussion throughout church history. Do we still have the old man? Or do we just have the new man? Are we a combination of the old man and the new man fighting with each other? I mean, just exactly how do these things come together in a theological sense. Well, here's how I understand it. To start off with, when you became a Christian, when you exercised saving faith in Christ on His terms of repentance and faith, you became a new creature. You became a new man. You became a totally new person. And you stopped at that moment, being that old man, that old self. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creation. New creation. So there's not two of you. There's only one of you. And this section of Colossians is saying, since you are a new creation, you ought to act like it. If it's really true, then there ought to be the outward manifestation, a, a new style of life that demonstrates on the outside that new inner reality. If you will remember a few weeks back in verses 5 to 9 that we studied, Paul gave us a list of things that we need to kill, to put aside, as he says in the newer versions, things like, remember, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech. But we see here at the start of verse 9, do not lie to one another. And now he moves from the negative, the things we need to kill, the things we need to put aside, to the positive in this text. That's the, since you have laid aside the old self in verse 9 and put on the new self in verse 10. Now let's get into the positive side, starting in verse 9. After Paul says, do not lie to one another, and we covered that part last time, he says, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, verse 10, and have put on the new self. Now stop there. Since you laid aside the old self and have put on the new self, do this. Now that's going to be his point going forward. That's going to be his basis for the exhortation that's going to start later in verse 12. It's critical for the Christian to understand that the reason for why we, on our part, need to change our lifestyle is because God has changed our lives. Back to verse 9. Look at it. Since, you see that word? Since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, verse 10, and have put on the new self. That's a stated fact. Since you, it has been done. You are a brand new person. And since you are, again, you ought to act like it. There ought to be a change in your lifestyle. Now let's zero in on that phrase, the old self in verse 9. What does that mean, to lay aside 
the old self with its evil practices. Well, again, let me remind you, you've already done it if you're a Christian. Verse 9, since you laid aside the old self and have, verse 10, put on the new self. So what is the old self? Well, Romans 6, 6. Look at it. Knowing this, what happened to our old self? That our old self was crucified. Ephesians 4.22 That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. So we learn two things there about the old self. The old self is crucified and the old self is corrupt. And that leads us to ask, what was it that was corrupt in us? Well, it was our old Adamic inherited unregenerate self, our Adamic nature, because we are by nature children of what? Wrath, Wrath, the Bible says. And at our conversion to saving faith in Christ, the old man was killed. He's dead. He's gone. So if you ask me, do you believe that a Christian has a new man and an old man, you know what I say? No! Because the old self that the Bible says was corrupt and has been crucified and is dead and you are now a new man and just to make sure, mankind, you are a new creature. In other words, let me put it like this. The old self is the unregenerated man. And that old self is replaced by the new regenerated man. If you have an old man and a new man at the same time, how can you be regenerated and yet in some way unregenerated at the same time? You can't. We just learned in Colossians 2.10. Look at it. And in him, that is Christ, you have been made what? Complete. So let me ask you. Is salvation whole? Is it total? Are you a new creation? Yes. You are not half regenerated and half unregenerated. You are not a new regenerate man and an old unregenerate man warring against one another. Now there is a war going on in there. There's a war. But it isn't between the old creature and the new creature because you're a new creature alone if you have believed in Christ savingly. Are you picking up what I'm putting down here? We don't have a new man and an old man. You can't be regenerated and unregenerated at the same time. Listen to Thomas Goodwin. He says, there are but two men. There are but two men standing before God, Adam and Jesus Christ. And these two men have all other men hanging at their belts. Hmm? In other words, you're either in Adam or you're in Christ. Another commentator named Linsky says this, the old man is not converted. He can't be. He's not renewed. He can only be replaced. And he can only be replaced by the new man, by a creative act of God and by no less. Now, at this point, You're sitting out there and you can't help but say, okay, Brother Philip, I see that. I may be in a new self and I see that you're telling me that the old self is dead, but I'm still having some trouble. I'm I'm having trouble struggling with sin. Where is it coming from? 
Well, if you would have come to Sunday school, you found out. The problem is your new self is still connected with your flesh. Now, listen carefully right here at this point. I think it's very helpful that you have got to make a distinction between the old man, that term, that understanding, and the term, the flesh. Okay? We got to get our distinctions right here. Okay? Because sometimes that phrase in the Bible, in your flesh, is used to refer to the old man. If you're in the flesh, you cannot please God. That's referring to the old man. But sometimes your flesh is simply referring to your humanness, and that's still around with the new self. John MacArthur says the flesh always runs to the closet and drags out the old clothes and says, here, put these on today. You ever had that happen? Now, listen to this. We are going to be, every Christian, the same new creature that we are right now forever. There's no change that has to be made there when we die because the change has already been made. And that's why Paul says concerning the flesh... Wretched man that I am who will set me free from the body of this death. And he means there the flesh that we still have to deal with in this life. We will be set free from it. One day. But not yet. For any Christian in this room. Not yet because we're still sitting up in here living and breathing. Now, let's go back to Colossians. So, we've seen verse 9. Big emphasis, since. Underline that in your Bible. Since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Now, let's look at the progress of the new self, verse 10. And half, you could even underline half, put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So the new self is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So let's unpack that for just a minute. You became a Christian. And you're a new creature. A new self. And you start out day one with that Daily battle with your flesh. But little by little, day by day, as you're living out your Christian life, there is a progression that's happening in that struggle. Now, you've seen me do the stock market graph. It's like this in the Christian life. You get good, get money, doing good. Oh, that's a bad day. Oh, put them old clothes on today. But what's steadily happening? Where am I heading? Right? Yeah, y'all haven't seen that a million times. You probably see it a million more. But that's a picture. It's a slow progression. I don't know about for you, but for me, it's like being on the Atchafalaya Basin when they had a wreck. <laughs> the new self, the new man, begins to grow. When you become a Christian, it's like, it's like a healthy baby. A healthy baby has all its parts in all the right places, in it, but it starts to grow and grow each day that goes by. And it's not too long for that little baby that couldn't even crawl, that was just laying in the crib, starts to become a toddler. Starts to walk around and terrorize your house. Like my grandson Lawson, just, just the other day, I'm not kidding you. I turned my head for maybe nine seconds. 
and he took off in my bathroom. And by the time I got in my bathroom, he had three drawers pulled out, the main cabinets open, going through them. And when he looked up, he had two tubes of chapstick sticking out of his mouth. <laughs> How did he do that in about nine seconds? Well, he's not in the crib anymore. He's grown. Okay? Same thing is true in your spiritual life. You started out, you're born again. You're a new creation, but you start to grow and to progress in the Christian life. I started out as an Arminian. Sorry for those of you who are not of that persuasion, but I went down some theological roads that I later completely got off of to never return to, thank the Lord. But more importantly than that, there is in the life of a Christian not only progression, but listen carefully to this. This is, this is the main point. The growing that you do, the growing that God has you going through is a growing into the likeness of Jesus. Now, can you fathom that? So look there in verse 10. Being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one Jesus who created him. So the new nature is complete, but at the same time, it has a capacity for growth, just like a healthy baby is complete with all its part. And at the same time, it has a capacity to grow. The new birth is a recreation in God's image that was lost in the fall. And the Christian life that we go through is a deepening of that image that God engraved. An ever-deepening image. Day by day, Christian, God deepens that image. And he uses all kind of means. Bad things, good things. Trials, troubles, tribulations. But he also uses days like today. Means of grace, church, fellowship. On and on we could go, right, with the list. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. And I'm telling you, I just can't wrap my mind around that right now here today in 2023 on Hooper Road. But one day we will all be totally conformed to the image of Christ, that we will be like him, that we will be joint heirs with him. I'm not kidding you. I'm good with being the, the janitor in heaven. Yes, sir. Give me the broom, Lord. I'll get over here and sweep up what never needs to be swept for eternity as long as I can be in your presence and serve you. But if you're a Christian, it's God's plan not to make you the janitor. It's God's plan to make you to be like the son, the eternal son of God. That is where this promised progress that we're going through is eventually going to take you if you're a Christian here today. Now look at that wording in verse 10. The new self is being renewed to a true Knowledge, that word is a deep, thorough, full, complete knowledge. There is a process of renewing that is going on with us that will one day bring us to a full knowledge. And he's not saying renew you by knowledge, although that is a part of it. He is renewing you by knowledge. But what he's saying here is renewing you to the place where the knowledge is complete. Full knowledge. William Hendrickson says this, when a man is led through the waters of salvation, they are ankle deep at first. But as he progresses, they become knee deep and they reach to the loins and finally impossible except by swimming. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 4.16. Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart. 
But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. It's so clear that the process of maturing us, of conforming us to Christ, goes on day after day. Folks, that's why it's so slow. Don't get aggravated. Understand, you're going through this process like this exactly as he has you. He matures some faster. He brings some to knowledge faster. He's got everybody growing at different levels for his reasons and his purposes. But it's working all of us toward true, complete, full knowledge. That's why Paul in Romans 12, being transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. And being totally conformed, he says, to the image of Christ. And that's why 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, so critical for you to understand in the practical. All scripture is inspired by God. That word in the Greek, breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. In other words, you can only reach maturity by the word of God and by the study of the word of God. Not just coming here to hear me preach the word of God. That's part of it. And, and the good works, the good works are the result. Good works come out of the fact that you have been regenerated by God and the progression, progression of knowledge that you gain, which comes only from your study of the word of God as you live your Christian life. And though the process may be slow. So, and it, and it seems so really slow when you're in it, like in the present, like right now, and you're sitting here thinking about it. But I want you to think back. When you first became a Christian, and I want you to compare that to where you are now today. Now, there ought to be some progress that you can see there that happened. Like the old saying goes, I'm not what I want to be. Mm. I'm not what I should be. But thank God Almighty, I ain't what I used to be. Yes, Amen? Amen? But again, your rate of progress toward being like Christ and growing into spiritual maturity, it has two parts, two people working there. It'll always depend on your intake of the word of God and then putting into action what you learn from the word of God and God working in you and through you to make that happen. Both things happen simultaneously. Now, next point I want you to see is the partnership of the new self. Look at verse 11. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man, but Christ is all and all. So today we've looked at the position, we've looked at the progress, and now the great truth of the partnership of your new Christian self. It's not just the growth of the habits or attitudes of being the new self. There's something else going on here. You got a new partnership. And this is so, so needed to be understood properly and biblically, particularly by this generation in which we're living in. Within the, the adopted by grace family of God, there is the total abolishing of all secular, cultural, and racial barriers. Within the church... There should no longer be any racial barriers. There should be really no place for race. Really, even the discussion of race shouldn't even be a discussion we're having inside the church. There's no place for it at all. Why? The ground is what? Level at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. But unfortunately... 
especially in the last 10 or 15 years, we got a lot of people in the professing church making all these distinctions between white Christians and black Christians and Latino Christians and Jewish Christians and Asian Christians. And let me just take a little aside here for you and say, it shouldn't even be labeled as an issue using the word race. Yes, we are all in here made up of different ethnicities, but we are also made up of one race. There's only one race, the human race, different ethnicities. But even more importantly, if we're in Christ, it says in Ephesians 2 that God has made us all one new man. One new man. We're all individually new creatures in Christ, but we make up one new man. Christianity, folks, is all of us who have come to Christ savingly. And the melanin count in your skin plays absolutely no role in this reality at all. I have darker skin and a higher melanin count than Roger Dale does. Miss Lola has a darker skin and a higher melanin count than I do. What meaning does that play within the context of the function of the church? None. None at all. And yet, because of our fallen condition, we have these separated groups within the church based on ethnicity and melanin counts. And that's just a result of living in a fallen world. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully here. I am not denying the severe problems that we have with racial issues in this country and around the world. You, you think racism issue is bad here. Roger Dale, between the Japanese and the Chinese. Huh? Wow. You talk about some people that hate one another. And let me ask you this. Have you ever in your life seen hatred for a people group like we're seeing right now with the Jewish people? Have you ever? I'm going to tell you something. I saw a drone shot yesterday at what I would label easily a Jewish hatred protest in London, England. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was a big wide street and the drone was flying over the top of it and it just seemed to never end. Hundreds of thousands. It looked like more than the 300 estimated thousand we had in Washington, D.C. last week as they were shaking the gates of the White House. And this is happening in many cities and nations all across the world. Now, I'm not denying real problems here. Terrible actions. Evil hatred perpetrated by heinous racists that comes from many different people groups all over the world, all throughout human history. But what I am saying is that the issue itself should never even be an issue at all within the church of Jesus Christ. And if you think this is a new problem, now think again. At the time that this letter here was written to the Colossians, you want to talk about some racial barriers? Let's talk about the Jews and the Gentiles. They sure didn't, Brother Lee. They had religious barriers with the circumcised and uncircumcised. They had cultural barriers with the barbarians and the Scythians. They had social barriers with the slaves and the free men. They had barriers in all those levels of their society. And guess what? Christianity comes on the scene and says they're all irrelevant. All those barriers. You are all now one new man, Christians. And a lot of them had a really hard time with this new reality. And so I want to close out today by showing you some of these barriers that they had that we can easily make application of in our situation here today because there's nothing new under the sun with this subject. Now, you already know the Jews and the Gentiles had been at each other 
for centuries. I mean, there was no fellowship between these two groups. They had nothing to do with each other. A Jew, remember, was forbidden from even entering into a Gentile house. I mean, we talked about all the crazy rules here many times. A Jew wouldn't eat a meal with a Gentile utensil or cooked in a Gentile pot. Maybe shake the dust off of the Gentile dirt off their feet. I mean, on and on. You already know that story. And the Gentiles were just as bad. They felt the same way about the Jews. And then all of a sudden, the gospel comes along and says, you're one. Wow. I don't think I can get words to, to describe how radical that was for this first group of Jews and Gentiles. That the church was one. The Gentiles grafted in. But do you want to know how powerful, true, Regeneration is all over the world at that time happening over and over and over. Synagogues kept dissolving into churches. Amen. You can't explain that humanly. Look at verse 10 again. And have put on the new self. Now notice this word who is being renewed, keep that word in mind, to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created in verse 11, a renewal, same renewal, in which there is no distinction between, and then the list starts. Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised. Greeks, they're referring to Gentiles. And then Paul lists barbarian next and Scythian. Now, Listen, those are not two different kinds of people. Those are two of the same kind, but both of them were barbaric. Okay, the Greeks came up with the term barbarian to describe people who had not been trained in the Greek language and in Greek culture. When anybody got around them and spoke another language, it sounded to the Greeks like bar, 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 and that's where the word came from. Okay? And in a general sense... It referred to the uncultured and uneducated masses all around the world. But a Scythian, a Scythian was the worst kind of barbarian. They were the most uncultured barbarians of the day. They were a nomadic people. And get this, quick internet search will show you this. The Iranians today have their origins in the Scythians. Look it up. Originally of Iranian stock. In 7 BC, they went into what's called the Fertile Crescent, where Babylon was between the Tigris and Euphrates River, and they invaded that land, and they committed terrible atrocities when they did. They were the worst of the worst. Listen to some of the descriptions from historians of the past about the Scythians. In addition to the Fertile Crescent, they invaded Asia. After that, they had driven the Sumerians out of Europe. From there, they marched against Egypt and that part of Syria called Palestine. And here's a description of how they operated. They drank the blood of the first enemy killed in battle. They made napkins of the scalps and drinking bowls of the skulls of the slain. They had the most filthy habits and never washed with water. Josephus says this, The Scythians delight in murdering people and are little better than wild beasts. Origen says there couldn't be any more barbaric people than the Scythians. And their distant descendants, the Iranians, are 100% responsible for what went on in Israel on October the 7th. Direct bloodline. Now look back again at verse 11. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, now focus in on the end, but Christ 
is all in all. Now, can you imagine back in them days? I ain't going to church with a Scythian. Are you out of your mind? He liable to slit my throat. They need their own church on the other side of town, the Scythian Baptist Church. Not so, says Paul. In Christ, there's a new relationship. In Christ, there's a new partnership. Let me tell you, I would love to have, notice this word carefully, regenerate Iranian people right here in our church. Love them. Bring them on. That's the point here. None of that matters within the context of the local church or of the church at in general, Paul also brings up the concept of slave and free man. You know what Aristotle called a slave? A living tool. That's how they were thought of. Property. I don't have time to go through all the detail about slaves in those days. But when a slave came to Christ on his terms, instantly he became a brother. Amen. And if he was gifted by God to be an elder... You might walk into an early church and he's up there teaching the word of God to the landowners that he worked for. Read Philemon. I'll get to preaching it one day. Paul says to Philemon, look here. Your runaway slave Onesimus came up here to Rome. He was a prisoner. And he met me. And guess what? Now he's a brother in Christ. And I'm sending him back to you, not just as your slave, but as your brother. The spread of the church like wildfire in these conditions and circumstances during these days is one of the most amazing stories in all of human history when you get all this. The gospel made its deepest impression on the pagan world in the way that it destroyed barriers that were built upon religion and race and cultural and social issues. It wiped them all out and these people came together just like we're all together here from different backgrounds and different ethnicities. It's really stunning to think about how a slave could become a teacher or how a Scythian could become a pastor in a church full of educated Greeks. Now bear with me. One more historical example, because I know that's food smelling good. It's a true story here. The arena of Carthage, 202 AD. The spectators were watching with glee the slaughtering of Christians. And in that arena, an incredible scene took place, which gives us a great example of how profound an impact Christianity made in these times. As the crowd surely jeered and cheered with glee, the slaughtering of Christians. They'd feed them the wild beasts. They did all kinds. Just look in history. Terrible things to them. Right in the middle of this, the, the Roman matron Perpetua, who was very wealthy, very high class woman, she stood holding the hand of her slave, Felicitas, and both of them faced a common death at the same time for their love for Jesus Christ. You can't explain that, humanly speaking, folks. That is what Christianity and genuine saving faith did where a slave and a master died together with love and steadfast faith and commitment for the same Christ. Sovereign grace destroys all barriers, bridges all gaps. 
How does Paul sum this up? Look again in verse 11. But Christ is all in all. And if Christ is in us all, then we are all equal in Christ. Every one of us. Jesus is king of all, whether you bow to him in this life. And if you don't in this life, you will in the next. Only it'll be in judgment. But he indwells all believers. And because he does, he erases all those differences. Ethnicities, cultural, social barriers. Again, Ephesians 2. He makes us all one new man. A whole bunch of new men in process of becoming one new man perfectly one day. He is the one who guarantees the gradual perfection one day of that new man to full knowledge that equals Christ-likeness. Right now, we are all in that process. We are all in that progression. In this text, what Paul has been talking about is what God has done. Next time, we're going to talk about what we are to do in response to what God has done. But before we get to next time, let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11. Because with joy, we get to celebrate all this. The reason all this is true of us is what's represented right here in front of me in front of this pulpit in the Lord's Supper. Now, I want you to remember this. This text we're going to quote in 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 27. This is Paul getting on to these people because they're not having the Lord's Supper right. Now, that's not why I'm quoting this to you as we start our Lord's Supper service. As most of you know, I'm quoting this to you to get you to understand the gravitas of the Lord's Supper, the weightiness of it, that this is not a fleeting thing that we're supposed to do. We're not just supposed to do it flippantly. That's, kind of we, that's the reason why we kind of space it out a little bit every other first Sunday of the month. There's a weightiness to what we're doing here. As we read in the back of the bulletin about worthiness, you, you understand your unworthiness and the only worthiness that you have is worthiness in Christ to take the Lord's Supper. But listen what Paul says as he's getting on to him. This gives you some idea of how serious this is. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord, but a man must examine himself and then do so. In so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. That means they died for that reason. The reason why I quote this is for you to understand the seriousness of this Lord's Supper celebration. Now, as I've said before, as Derek Thomas says, now don't let that bring a dark thundercloud in here and get everybody all depressed and sad. No, 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 no. Put the gravitas over here. You get right here. In a minute, we're going to take a moment of silence and you, You do business with God, as the old preachers used to say. Just acknowledging your struggle every day, Romans 7, with the flesh. So you got three things, gravitas, doing that. But then over here, you ought to be full of joy as a Christian when you come to the Lord's Supper. It ought to be the most joyful thing you do this week. It's come to the Lord's table because he has imputed you with his righteousness. And that's what makes you right for heaven. So we're capable of doing all three of those things at the same time, are we not? That's what we do when we do the Lord's Supper. So let's take a moment of silence and bow our heads and close our eyes and do just that.